uh, there's been quite a lot of mention of culture and ethos, and I would concur with, with what's been said. Um, our, our big report is coming out later on in June. There will be much more about this there. But I would say that culture and ethos are absolutely critical to this. Um, if we can just go back to the issues that were being discussed with regard to searching um, in, in John and his colleagues' evidence. Um, uh, they're absolutely right that things did change at Haskfield after I raised them. Um, but uh, there was undoubtedly a culture there. In fact, what people said was the governor required this to be done regardless of what anybody else wanted. Um, so children were subject to two search regimes there. One was um, routine searching on entry, where uh, they had to take off um, boys. And of course, we've got girls in SDCs as well. So that contrasts with what happens in the adult estate with women. Um, they were taken into a room with two staff of the same gender, uh, and the system was the same. They had to take off the top half of their clothes, hand them over, and then and, and they were given no gowns. They had to stand, and then they had to take off their bottom half of their clothes and hand them over. Uh, I said, what if girls or boys have been sexually abused? How do you deal with that then? Well, they talk them through it, but they sit on the bed and talk them through it, which I have to say rather alarmed me, because this was done in the health wing. Um, and, and what if the girls are menstruating? Well, they're given a, they have to take off their, their pad, and, and they're given a bag, a, a, a bag, and then they're given a clean pad, all in front of two other people. Um, and then there was the routine searching after uh, visits, and those were called dignified searches, and they were dignified because the youngsters were given gowns, um, so the others, by implication, I'm afraid, were the undignified searches. I'm delighted that this has been taken very seriously by my colleagues sitting behind me, and, um, and the, the necessary changes have been made. I'll give you another example. The former commissioner and myself, Al and I, went to Ashfield in 2009, and we asked for information about searching there. Um, and we were told that in the calendar year 2008, just over 12,500 searches took place. Um, because every child was searched routinely on entry and exit. Uh, together with the um, intelligence-led searches that took place at other times. Um, they said uh, contraband had been found on four occasions in that year. Um, I'm very pleased, having now um, seen somebody from Ashfield, subsequent to that, that following our visit and the concerns we raised, again, they have moved to a position in which they no longer do routine strip searches, and I'm told that there has been no increase in contraband. So I think we have the evidence that people can change quite quickly when they put their mind to it, and that it's, it's not leading to uh, an increase in smuggling of, uh, of contraband. Into, into units, and, and that, that is very pleasing. I'll stop. Thank you very much for that uh, eloquent introduction. Um, can I go to a, a fundamental issue? The Howard League has argued over a number of years that children in custody should not fall within the criminal justice system, but should fall within the responsibility of whatever government department for the time being and whatever its name, that has um, supervisory responsibility for children um, is that an issue, in your view, that is worth pursuing? Well, I, I think that's a very important question. Of course, what we've got now is a situation in which the joint unit has been disbanded between the old DCSF and the Ministry of Justice. Um, I do think what, whatever, whoever holds responsibility, there must be a child-centered, welfare-based approach for troubled youngsters who end up getting into trouble with the law. And, a much more sensible approach so that a lot of children don't get into trouble with the law when, quite frankly, other things are taking place in their lives. And if I may give you another example, I was sitting in a youth court in Peterborough recently, uh, and um, as part of my work on, on, on the National Advisory Group with uh, Sir Keith Pearson, uh, and I watched a pretty sorry procession go before the magistrates that morning, to be quite honest. One of them, who stands out, um, was a 14-year-old boy who was up before them for an offence that I hadn't heard of before, but something, something like swearing, using offensive language to a police officer. Uh, and uh, he pleaded guilty because he told the police officer to F off. 
And what happened was he was running around a field near his home, and a police officer came by and told him to stop. So he swore at him, so he told him to stop, so he said, so ding dong, ding dong. And so he threw a stick at him, which landed a long way short of the police officer, who then called for reinforcements. And the boy was uh, brought into custody and charged, he did more swearing then, and charged, um, and was brought before the magistrates. And it transpired that the first thing the magistrates were told was that he was suffering post-traumatic stress disorder and in fact seeing a psychiatrist twice a week, which in my experience is pretty unusual uh, for post-traumatic stress disorder. He was 14 now, but as a result, consequence of having seen his older brother when this lad was two years old being stabbed with a screwdriver. Uh, so that was bad enough. And then his mother, who looked pretty rubbish, I have to say, asked the magistrates if she could add something, and they said for sure. And she said, well, I've been waiting for an explosion because this, is the this was the late March. The offence happened on the 22nd of March. So on the 15th of March, his father died. Um, only five, so it was just a few days before. And she said, I and I've been waiting for the explosion. So we had a ridiculous situation in which a boy who clearly was in need of support and had been for many years needing support, was getting it now from a psychiatrist but needed familial support, had actually ended up falling foul of the criminal justice system. It wholly and utterly unnecessary. Um, taking up mental health issues, which you mentioned in that answer, can I tempt you to a conventional scale of one to five, starting from very poor and finishing with excellent? On that scale, if you're prepared to do it, how would you rate the general quality of mental health provision, CAMS provision, given to children in custody? Um, it's, it's not as easy as just, you know, finding a point on that scale because it's variable. Like much of what happens across the secure state, it is variable. I see good practice and I have seen not such good practice. Indeed, in some places I've seen practice that, is, that I would put at the very bottom end of that, of that scale. And there are other places where I've seen practice that I would put at a much, why much higher think, end. Why do you think, given that is yes. the case, and it's my observation yes. too, why do you think that practices are so variable? Why are they not able to standardise the practices to the highest quality available? Well, I, again, very interesting. I mean, one of the things that we've, we highlight in the report that will come out in June is the issue of leadership. And I think there are two questions here. There is the, the national question and, and issues about consistency across the whole of the secure state. And of course, yeah, we're talking about the health service as well. Um, and people's commitment in the health service to children, which is also variable. Uh, and, and then leadership within each uh, part of the secure state. So where there is good CAMS, or mental health provision in the secure state, it is because the governor in that institution and Ray Hill behind me is, I mean him is one of the places where I saw was much better on this, um, where, where Ray was governor, um, it, it have brought their leadership to bear upon this and ensured that um, the right understanding is held by the commissioners such that um, the proper facilities are commissioned. On the other hand, I've been somewhere where there was a, a mental health team of five, but not one of them had training in child and adolescent mental health. They were all adult trained. That again, now that was raised with the YJB, that has, tra that has changed. Uh, so I do think it is about leadership and that's, that's also in the NHS.